All right, so we're going to have our feedback session for um, the first child. We did um, therapist training and we also did um, some parent training. Now this child is in a very brief session and the child has a fair number of needs and so there's definitely more active involvement of our therapist which you know ideally you would want to transfer that over but in a, this brief time that wasn't always um, easy to do. So I think we had some progress Developmentally, this child, uh, we figured out ex pretty clearly where he is. So he's at baby games. He needs to develop those baby games and simple contingencies for communication. Um, we can start to bring in some objects, but we have some very clear directions for those objects. And we're going to spend the majority of our time in person engagement and uh, communication development. So, Jilly, do you want to talk about the, do you want to watch the clip and yeah, then we'll let's talk watch about it? First, but um, so these are just some of the routines that we were able to establish in our sessions today, and then just by you know labeling simple things like bubbles, car, ramp, and more, he was able to pick up those vocabulary within the session. So he has a lot of potential, you know, when we model really simple words for him. So let's watch this clip of the bubbles. <laughs> So he was able to pick up, you know, signing more just within the bubble routine. And then later on in the bubble, I don't know if you guys saw within session, he actually approximated a bubble, which is really exciting. Um, so let's watch the next clip. And this is the, oh, the snack routine. So again, you know, him using the sign for more. So within different contexts, he's able to generalize it. The more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he's a really smart guy. You know, after a few tries with a snack, he's able to sign more to request for more snacks. Now, what is the rationale? Maybe, do you want to talk about allowing him to wander, which some people wouldn't allow him to wander? So, the rationale for that in this context? Well, it is a snack break, so I want to make sure that he actually gets a really nice, a real break, you know. So he doesn't have to sit down to eat his snack. And if he's more comfortable wandering around and coming back, especially snack is something so motivating for him, I think it's okay just to have him come back and request for more when he wants more. Mm -hmm. Instead of forcing him to sit down and then throw a tantrum in the middle of a snack time. Mm -hmm. I think you can look at it too. It's just two separate behaviors that we're looking at. One mm -hmm. behavior is sitting at the table, the other behavior is requesting, engaging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're not worried about sitting at the table right now. We're worried about requesting exactly. and engaging. Mm -hmm. so, and I, I think he's the little he's a, the type of child that less demands, you're going to get a lot more out of him. So that wandering and him being able to kind of walk freely, he knew where to come back to. It wasn't like he was randomly going up to people saying more. He knew exactly where the snack was. He was aware of his environment, which I think is a, a big thing mm -hmm. to look at. And he went back. And it was even interesting. He knew when you had the Doritos versus when mom mm -hmm. had their Doritos, he knew who to go to, yeah. which is great. He wasn't always going back to mom. So mm -hmm. there was an awareness, I think, of his social environment and less demands put on him elicited right. more independent right. communication. And I think that that's key. Less demands, you get actually more from him. So it's counterintuitive to the way that some people would approach the behaviors that, mm -hmm. that you see. So I think you can see within session, you get pretty big increases for what we had seen in the, 
the two days prior. And I also think that um, going on with that child-led, um, when he wanders, he doesn't want that snack. He's not interested. When he comes back, you know for a fact that what he's coming back for is that thing that he's reaching for, which is that mm -hmm. snack. So when you're saying more, it's really meaning more chips mm -hmm. or Doritos. So you really know that you're targeting a, a, a good behavior, like a functional behavior, rather than hoping that that is what he wants and trying to guess mm -hmm. and trying to create the, the moment so that if, he, if it is what he wants, then <laughs> we kind of put it there. and. Yeah, it's much clearer with the snack, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay, so next clip. Proximations there, really exciting. Um, again, that's why you know we give a lot of input and don't demand output. And you can see just by modeling those words for him, he was able to pick it up within a routine. So it's also important that we establish routines so he knows that when I roll down the car, I'm going to say go, or he's holding the car, I'm going to label it for him because he's looking at the object. So obviously, he's interested in that car. I'm going to give him the vocabulary for it. And so with with him, you know, the routines were very brief. The song routine and the bubble routines were longer because those are really at his level. The car routine is harder. It's a very brief routine. So if we saw him again tomorrow, we would come back to those same routines and probably the little car routine might be a little longer. So you have to be very patient not demand a lot, just kind of go along with what you can build. So you're building his social stamina over time. I, I think what I found very interesting, just even by watching this and watching you do it, is really making sure that you have their attention before you actually do the action. And I think as a lot of therapists, we say, oh, well, I'll just roll it down and he'll, he'll get there. You know, well, he'll see it or he'll hear it and then recognize it, but then they actually miss a lot of the action. So I think taking away from that of, um, and really cueing in onto when he's looking at you, because I know that you know you did it. He looked right at you and you went, you know, and it's having that reaction and being really quick about it, mm -hmm. which is something I think you have to learn mm -hmm. a lot, you know, yeah. and just being aware of it. But it's something that you really get his attention that way a lot better. And lot also, more. you know the process, so you know what you're trying to get. So it's much easier to utilize the strategies. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just oh, well, we're supposed to do this three times. Mm -hmm and he's going to respond. So it's more thinking about, well, what is, what is it you're trying to get? Which is why Jilly kind of gives up on it pretty quickly, too, because it's a very short routine. Yeah, and then, again, we don't recruit attention by saying, look, right. and then roll the car down the ramp. So actually, you know, picking up those really brief moments, yeah. and then if he's looking at the toy, we're going to model something yeah. for him. Mm -hmm. So this was the end of the... Uh, this is the mother training. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So is this all we wanted to talk about I with this? I have a question about uh -huh. when you actually have the time to uh -huh. do the parent training, mm -hmm. and I know it's over the course of 10 to 12 weeks or mm -hmm. however the time frame is. While you're doing that, because I notice here, and I even notice when I'm doing parent training, I end up talking more to the parent and then not engaging with the child as much, mm -hmm. and you're losing out on that. So mm -hmm. when you're doing this, just kind of how you did it, 
you sort of briefly interjected moments, but then you really sit after with them, I'm assuming, and do you go through videos with them, and is it that intense, or I'm just curious as to how I can try to incorporate a little bit of some of the things we're doing with the parent and, and how mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. So usually we do a really brief introduction of the module that we're doing for that day, mm -hmm. and it really depends on the child. It's a, if a child that's e e easily lose their engagement, then we'll start right off. But mm -hmm. if the child is pretty well behaved and can is calmer, then mm -hmm. we can go through the um, handout a little bit longer. Okay. But usually it's really brief, like five minutes, okay. and then we start going into our session. And then we'll give them the strategies within the session, because it's about you know 60 minutes long when we're in the home. Right. Um, and then after that, if they have any questions, we can still answer the questions and go over the module in more detail with the parents. Um, while the kid is doing like a snack, you know, mm -hmm. snack, they can mm -hmm. eat a little bit of snack and I can talk with the mom, okay. things like that. And we also give a handout. Yeah. So they have mm -hmm. sort of the visual information right. um, as well. For, um, for children who are minimally verbal and who are older, we actually do workshops with parents. So that's a completely different um, study mm -hmm. where we actually do, um, I think one day a week is parent mediated the second day is we do a workshop and a therapist works with the child. Okay, so any other questions about the parent mediated part? All right, so should we plan for a moment for the next child, which is parent mediated, right? Mm -hmm. And it's you. Amy. It's Amy. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we talked about it a lot already this morning. Um, but we're going to try to bring in some new toys today, maybe toys at a little bit lower of a play level, see if we can get some things going with him. Um, I'm going to try the water as well to see if that can kind of detract a little bit from um, his focus on the lights. Uh, maybe he'll be more focused on the water, and that way I'll be able to model more skills within his focus, which is so important, as we saw in Jilly's session, which I don't think I was able to do very well yesterday. Um, and then also I'll bring in some presentation combination toys and some general combination. And I think we'll do snacks too, I think that worked well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. This is our final wrap-up session, um, the last um, intervention session. So we saw two little boys, they're twins, identical twins, and we did a very brief uh, mother-child um, mediated play. So we want to make sure that we cover any final questions and we want to talk a little bit about the two boys who are actually quite different from each other. So one boy, the first boy, Javier, we had seen, um, this is the third day. So yesterday, n no real moments of engagement, so we got a lot of information from that session. Today came in completely different um, kind of session. So we did a lot of different environmental arrangements. One, we closed off the mirror. So he, that was a, huge it was a huge <laughs> difference. That's right. We had him sitting at a table. So the fact that he spends most of his day sitting at a table when he's at school means that we probably don't want to, to switch too far from that in the beginning um, because he really couldn't handle it. So I think going back to the table made a lot of sense. Um, and then I think you had some really nice moments, and maybe, Amy, you want to talk about those moments. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I thought he was a lot more engaged today. I think we had some good routines. We were even able to expand on some of our routines, which is very exciting. Um, I agree. I think the table helped a lot. And you can tell he was even trying to get on the chair independently at some point. So I think he was very comfortable at the table. So I think that was a, a smart move <laughs> for us. Um, also, I think the play level really helped him a lot, too. So, you know, bringing the play level down just a little bit. I think the presentation combination level was great for him today. Um, we have a clip uh, with the pig that we can show now and talk about it.
I thought that was one of our better routines of the day. Um, he was able to expand independently. He also was a lot more focused on the toy and less on the ceiling, which I think helped a lot because he was able to see our model. So he saw me model that expansion. It took him a while to pick up on it, but he, he did. So I think the fact that he was able to see our models and that we were able to model in his attentional focus today clearly helped a lot. Did you get coordinated joint looks from him? Um, still, the eye contact wasn't amazing today. I definitely got more um, just one look to me, not necessarily coordinated with the toy, but that was still a lot better than yesterday where I really wasn't seeing any eye contact from him. Mm -hmm. So that was a plus. Yeah. I think yeah. he's coordinating the model to the toy or to the, you know, the second mm -hmm. object. So he is kind of looking at what we're doing, not necessarily at our face or eyes, but at what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. then looking back to where that might fit. Right. So we also tried the water play that we talked about earlier. And did you feel like that didn't work in the beginning? I think there were moments that worked. Um, I feel like I probably could have arranged the environment a little bit better in the beginning. I think we had too many toys in there and I think once I took some of them out and just put the rings in there or just put one bucket, he was able to then put the ball in. So I think make, structuring it for him a little bit more um, is helpful mm -hmm. and really looking at the environment and not having it be too messy. Mm -hmm. um, and then after a while he did start to just splash and it wasn't working anymore, right. but there were good moments. Uh huh. So one of the interesting things about him is that he tested with a little bit higher play level. And so he has some of these discrete skills that may have been taught to him, but he's clearly not making those connections. But he did pretty well with a lower play level. So the goal then would be to play more comfortably at that lower play level, really um, use that play and engagement with another person as a means for getting him to talk more, getting him to use more of his gestures, and then you can move up the play level. But I think the danger is to try to move the level up too fast, where he's just not able to really put it all together. So I think that'll be an important sort of next step for him, is just to continue on at this level of play. <coughs> you guys have any questions about that particular interaction? I do know that the eye contact is very difficult from him. And I'm just trying to think of ways that we can encourage that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. so it does seem very even avoidant. Yes. So I, I think the way to encourage it is to continue to not <coughs> recruit it, not demand it, and, and go along for a little while with trying to build routines so that he knows that you know he can trust you in this interaction. And like when he put that extra piece in the, tried to put it in the pig and it w didn't fit, once you have more of a rel relationship with him, you can kind of make that silly. You could even kind of sabotage what he's doing and you might get a look at you like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> um, so I think you just have to be patient with that. But I think you could lose him pretty quickly by demanding the eye contact. Um, so I, I would sort of wait it out. Do you feel the same way, Amy? Yeah, I, I agree. I think also the person engagement is the way to really start off getting the eye contact with him. Mm -hmm. um, during Ring Around the Rosie, for example, we were trying to get really low down in his eye level, um, and I think he had a couple of looks. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one way to start to build it, and then once mm -hmm. he gets that down, then we can move more into toys. That's mm -hmm. a good point because I think that when I was doing the lifting play, that was when I got the most mm -hmm. eye contact. Mm -hmm. And I got it the most the first two or three, and then after the third or fourth time, then it started to wane. So maybe he was really excited at first and, mm -hmm. you know, looked towards me. Right. So then you need an expansion, mm -hmm. right? So even with a people game, you can expand it. So it doesn't get boring. It's not repetitive. Um, so ways to think about that. And I, I have a question. So... I think ch the choosing of the toys here seems to be a really critical aspect. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know that he plays with this pig at home with his mom and his grandmother. Um, so if, if you were to start off with a toy, if you find that he has these toys and he has like a, a familiar toy that is appropriate, would you start off with those or would you want to start off with a appropriate toy that he doesn't really know so that you can start off a new routine? I would say that 
I would want to use appropriate toys that parents have at the home so okay. that they can continue the routines once we leave because it's really going to be up to them, especially if it's a parent mediated intervention, to continue and that's really how the child is going to benefit, I'd say, the follow up. And of course we'll bring in some novel toys from our lab too so he doesn't get too bored. Okay, so do we want to talk about the next child, the twin? So that was tough because that was basically with no assessment and uh, one session. So let's see, who worked with him? Amy. Amy. Okay. Only Amy? Um, Amy and Elaine. Elaine. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're all funding together now. <laughs> <laughs> so do you normally work with him? Is he? Daniel. Yeah, I work with him. It's been kind of limited, but I've worked with him. Okay, so did you um, have any questions about that particular engagement? I don't think we have clips of him. Yeah. So, um. Um, I've noticed that with both of them, it seems to be that when you introduce the person is when they have, because I did, um, for my study, I did a familiarity assessment where I just put out all the toys and I see how they play with them. And he would get the drumstick and he would put it in the cup and he would like shake it. Um, he was banging on things with like different objects. He was having all these different combinations and all this play. And then um, when he was playing with another person is when he was just kind of like more mm -hmm. restricted in, <coughs> in his game. Mm -hmm. Right, so he's got some skills, but mm -hmm. he doesn't engage in social play. So again, we have to just increase that social stamina. And part of, you know, there could be lots of reasons why children sort of avoid the person with the play, but sometimes it's because we put too many demands on them in a play context where mostly, you know, uh, neurotypical children just get objects, they play with them, they show the parent. The parent's not that directive about the child's play, in part because the child knows how to play. When our kids don't know how to play or don't have as many skills, then we tend to teach them the skills. So he can see that he can show you some of the skills, but he doesn't trust to play with someone because he's been taught in a very, you know, this is what you need to do to play with this toy. And so, again, you're going to have to build that stamina, and he's going to need to trust you that you're not going to just, you know, demand him to perform in a certain way. Um, but there could be other reasons, too. It's hard to know. You might know better having known him. I think that might be one of the reasons, because I know a lot of parents like try to buy like puzzles and let's do this and let's and all the games are seem to be age appropriate because on the box it says <laughs> age appropriate, but, uh -huh. <laughs> but it may not be so appropriate. So it's hard. So it's over his head, and so yeah, then you're having to prompt too much. And I think you even said this in the session. You know, if we have to prompt too much, then it's probably not fun for him. Mm -hmm. So we want to be careful about that.